today I'll be talking about uh, trends in developments in deep learning. This is work that we've done at Google Brain along with you know many, many other people. I lead the TensorFlow efforts at Google, which is you know, one of our tools that's used for uh, supporting machine learning and deep learning. So let's get started. First, let's start with what's a neural network itself. So here's a very simplified picture, which takes an image at the bottom. It has these many layers, as you see, each layer has these neurons, which uh, fire, you know, some of them fire in every layer, not all of them do. And the outputs of those go to the next layer, which decide whether the next layer fires or not, and so on, and keeps going. Until finally at the output layer, it makes a prediction. Right. In this case, it makes seems to make the right prediction, but often it might make the wrong prediction as well while it's learning. <clears throat> so when this happens, uh, you know, while training, it's going to back to what's called using back propagation. It's going to tell the rest of the network there's some problem. It's going to adjust the weight so it keeps improving this. This is how basic deep neural networks look. Neural networks have been around for a long time. And one of the questions that keeps coming up is why now? Why is it so much better now? And so if you look, go back a little bit in the history, not all the way back, but say in the 80s and 90s, uh, this is roughly where the chart was, how things were, where, you know, if you looked at the scale, the accuracy, and so on, neural networks were okay, but there were many other machine learning approaches that did better. Why was this the case, and what's changed now? So let's take a look at this. What's, what's added over the last few years is a lot more compute. So basically, from a scale perspective, where we were is where the dotted line is on the 80s and 90s. Then when we added much more compute in the last few years, and as we moved here, this is basically where we are now, where neural networks are often better than many other approaches once you have the right kind of scale. Right? If you still have a very small problem, that may not be the, the best thing for you to start with necessarily. If you're doing regression, you might just want to do linear regression or logistic regression. That still works well for small kinds of problems, right? But as you scale up, um, the neural networks start to do a lot, lot better. So here's a chart that I love to show of you know, how deep learning took off at Google over the last few years. We started, you know, Google Brain started in 2011. And as you see, you know, the early start was slow. The first year we were still building out tools, working with one team and so on. Um, and then slowly, you know, one of the first things that we did was work with the speech team and they, they had a great uh, number of researchers doing research in this area too. So, so had success in that. But then, then over time, as you, see, you can see, there are lots and lots of these uh, applications today that use Google, that use deep learning. In fact, I would say most products at Google that you see use machine learning and, and likely deep learning in some form or another. So one of the first things we realized for making something like this successful is there's a need to build the right tools. Right. Um, you need to be able to do research. You need to be able to do uh, take that research into real products. And so what do we need from these tools? So here are some of the aspects that we thought were really important for a good machine learning system. <clears throat> you know, it needs to be easy to express new ideas. That's how research really builds upon things and, and does new things. So we definitely want it to be flexible for that. Um, especially in this case, like you saw in the earlier graph, uh, scaling out these models or scaling out these systems is important. That's been one of the hallmarks of how deep learning became more successful. So, so that was important. Now it turns out that you don't want to run this just in the data center. There are many applications, as you'll see later, where you actually want to run this once you have a trained model run them on the phone itself because it's like right there where, where the data itself is. So portability becomes very important. And even in the data center, it needs to run across many different platforms. Um, from an ideas perspective, you know, once you have something that you've done, you clearly want to be able to do it again. And then take that idea from a pure research thing into production. So, so all of these are really, really important for a, a good machine learning system. And so for that, we built TensorFlow. It's open source. Many of you hopefully have tried it out or used it before. It's an open source machine learning platform. It uh, you know, supports all the things I talked about. It's, you know, you can do things at large scale. 
it's really flexible. You can try out all kinds of research ideas and it runs in production as well. So, so for us, going from that research to production was really important as a research group, <coughs> being at Google where we care to keep the time between a new research idea going all the way into real product, keeping that down is really, really important and that helps us bring these new ideas to our real users. So here's um, roughly, you know, the timeline of how TensorFlow came about. TensorFlow started uh, back in 2014, I guess. In 2015 is when we did the initial release, uh, external release. Since then, we've, you know, added lots of features. It runs on many different platforms. It's distributed, of course. It's, you know, performance is improved. Uh, and lots more things, you know. And more recently, you know, this is missing a couple more. Um, releases now we're at 1.4 rc we, we've been really focusing on making it easier to use now um although you know people with lots and lots of um higher level apis that people can use without necessarily having to go into all of the details themselves every single time so here are some of the platforms you know i mentioned portability here are some of the platforms we support um, you know, on the data center, CPUs and GPUs, of course, GPUs, which is uh, Google's own custom chip. And, you know, this year we announced cloud GPUs, which will be available at Google Cloud soon. And also on the phones, you know, Android, iOS, to name, and there are many others too, like Raspberry Pi and so on. So in terms of, you know, you can also program it in many different languages. Python's the most well supported, especially while training. But if you want to deploy something in production, all of these other languages are also supported fairly well. It's, uh, you know, one of the most important things for uh, an open source project is the community. And that's something we really care about. And so, uh, you know, we, we have a great community with lots of development going on over a thousand contributors and uh, you know, really almost a thousand commits every month. There's lots of engagement happening on these different communities and you know, in Stack Overflow, GitHub, etc. There are folks from the community helping, you know, providing feedback, giving answers and so on, in addition to our team itself. And it's used in a wide variety of machine learning classes as well across the world. Really popular in GitHub, you know, the start, start is one metric, but it's popular in, in many ways. And it's really the fifth most popular project at GitHub, which has over a million projects. So, it's, so that's been amazing. Uh, it's great to see the success here. Here's a great example I like to point to. Um, and, you know, in this case, it's an open source project. You know, what you see on the left is basically cucumber farmers in Japan. And what the guy at the back did was he's, you know, his parents were farming cucumbers. And one of the things that they had to do every day, and the mom was doing in this case, was sorting these cucumbers every single day manually. So the, the guy at the back, their son is an engineer. He's an embedded systems engineer, so didn't really know machine learning. He decided to see what he could do with just TensorFlow, taking an initial image model. And he trained it on the, these sorted cucumbers and then connected with, with with Arduino controllers that you see, you know, pushing the arm there um, along with a small assembly line. And so really put this together so you could automate the entire sorting process. And it's, you know, really made it a lot easier for them and cut down the effort and so on. <clears throat> so let's take a look at some of the examples of things we've been doing at Google with deep learning, how it's been helping us, what are some of the things that uh, you know, are going well. So um, I mentioned earlier, speech recognition was, you know, one of the first ones that really applied deep learning. And, uh, you know, in this case, the idea is, okay, you get this, you know, people do voice search on your phone. People want to just ask for things with voice. And so there's a deep RNN in this case um, that takes the, the speech itself and generates the text. Back when it was done in you know 2012, and then you know in 2015 we had a second big upgrade. In 2012, when it was launched, um, when it replaced the earlier system, which was also based on machine learning, 
it, it was, you know, one of the researchers mentioned this was bigger than the research of like the last 20 years in this area combined. So it made a huge difference and it's been really, really helpful. Um, you know, if you use your phones now, if you haven't tried voice search, you should. It actually works in many different languages. So, so it does work across the world. And, you know, even in English with all kinds of accents and stuff, it's, it really works well. Um, on the image side, you know, the, this was the next thing that we were starting to look at. Back in 2011, there were, you know, computer vision was making something like 26% errors, whereas humans, um, you know, on this, this particular data set called ImageNet with a million class, a million images and a thousand classes, humans make roughly about 5% errors, right? And so it wasn't quite great. I mean, as you can see this on the left, we were basically seeing a, the computers were seeing a bloody picture. But move out a few years, and in 2016, this is down to 3% errors, right? So for this data set, again, in a very narrow domain, of course, uh, but here computers are now starting to do as well or better than humans in this, again, in this very, very narrow space. But so what does that mean? An example of how that was used is Google Photos. If you upload photos in Google, uh, you know, instead of having to label pictures or whatever yourself, you search for just what you care about and it'll automatically find that those for you. So how it's done, it's basically done using the same ideas of you know, image labeling, using a deep network that really labels every single picture that you have. And then when you search for it, it shows you the right pictures. And you know, it's been great for somebody like me who loves taking pictures, but it doesn't necessarily like to you know, label everyone because I have so many of them. Um, you know, another interesting thing was that we could take that model, take that image model in this case, and pretty much the same model we could apply to many different problems. The same model structure, just train it on a different data, and it's useful in very, very different contexts, right? So for the basic idea being, I have an image, I want to use these pixels to predict something and predict something interesting about it. Here, here's an example where we see, okay, in this image, this is taken by Street View, what parts are interesting? So it figures out where the text is, and you know, in this, this one it's trained for text, and it's identifying, okay, there's a big tree in here, not just in English, in different languages as well. There's some text that gives us the address there. And um, you know, this is basically being used to make our maps better, make what you see better, we can get, uh, better addresses with that. And, uh, you know, again, that, that's one area. Same thing applied on satellite images. It's being used for our project Sunroof, where given an address, you, it can give you an estimate of the number of, you know, you know, how much sunlight do you have? Is it worthwhile for you to get solar or not? And just gives you an initial uh, estimate before you even call in any, anybody, right? So, so, so somebody can just look at your house from, you know, just sitting at their desk and tell you, is it worthwhile for me to come over? It, should we even spend the time? And then give you some sense of what's useful even before we get started. Um, you know, medical healthcare is another very, very interesting area that's, uh, you know, been improving steadily. Recently, our group did, took these images of uh, the eye, the back of the eye in this case, or what are they called, frontal images. And a very similar model was used to detect diabetic retinopathy. So basically, take these images, you know, train a model on this, and see how well you do. And it turns out that you know, once you train on enough data, in this case, because many doctors have labeled these images, you can train on images that many, many different doctors have done put together. It actually performs as well or even better than the median of a number of ophthalmologists put together. So it's a really amazing. Think of how that can change things when you go to places which really don't have these doctors, right? Sitting, often sitting in some big cities, we feel like, okay, doctors are everywhere. Um, but there are many places in the world where we really don't have doctors, and if you could just take these pictures and use that to uh, 
um, make at least an initial diagnosis. So if there is a problem or if there's a high likelihood of problem, then they can actually go to a real doctor and find that even though it's a lot, a lot of work. Um, you know, another interesting area has been combining these vision ideas with robotics themselves. Um, so we, you know, in our research group, has have this lab with a number of different arms, 20 in together actually. And you know, one of the tasks that we wanted to teach was, okay, how do you, how do these robots pick up these items from a different bin, right? Very simple task that, you know, from a human perspective, it seems very, very simple. But when these robots started out, they really couldn't even figure out what it was, let alone pick it up. Um, and when they tried to pick it up, they would make all kinds of mistakes. But over time, you know, putting all this data together, training these models, it, they, they learn really, really well. And even if an object is partially occluded by something else, they'll be, they're able to move things around um, and pick them up. So, so they get really good very, very quickly. Another area is language understanding. You know, that's one of the key things that humans do, where we can talk to each other, understand each other, and you know, we have lots and lots of data in text form, right? That's basically how the web evolved first. And if we can use that to improve how computers understand that, there's a lot more we can do. Um, you know, one of the first things, of course, is search itself, something we deeply care about at Google, and so. When we introduced this in Google, uh, in Google search, rank brain, this was, we have hundreds of signals and this was the number three signal out of all the hundreds that we've been using for a long time. It was the biggest improvement in the last couple of years in uh, improving our search engine. Um, email is another one. So, you know, we launched this feature called Smart Reply where you get an image, and a small network decides whether to, do we want to generate some reply for this? Um, and then we use a larger network to generate a reply and you see that often on the phone as you know, a few options at the bottom. And you know, this was launched in November, 2015. Now, th this is interesting that in 2009, we had an April full Fool's Day joke that, okay, what if Gmail's gonna start writing your emails for you? Just six years, six and a half years later, we were able to launch a real product, which was not a joke, you know, just uh, a testament of how far things have come from uh, just a few years ago when this technology was not around or, or not really popular. And, you know, in just a few months after the launch, this was being used for more than 10% of the mobile inbox replies. So it's a really, really useful feature. Um, translation is another interesting, you know, way to see how much progress we are making in language translation, language understanding. As we can see today, there are people from all over the world and being able to understand each other's language is really important for us to make progress, for us to communicate. And so, you know, we've been thinking about translation, how can we improve it with these new techniques? So back in 2014, two research, three researchers in our lab decided to try a very simple model, um, you know, what are called LSTMs or sequence models, where on the input side, you pass in a sentence in, in one language, and then say, okay, I'm done with the sentence, and then the, it generates the target sentence. In this case, while training, it is given the target sentence, while uh, making a prediction when it does not have the target, it just starts to say, okay, this should be the target. And, you know that so so that was still early research you know we didn't know how well it'll do but <clears throat> from that that point you know we went to a real machine translate system that we launched last year with big quality improvements there were lots of challenges in scal scalability you know, this is one area where scalability was important really even for research not just for production and so the, what the model was, was basically a, a slightly more complex form of what we saw in the first one, where on the left for the input itself, we have lots of layers, not just one, we have eight layers, um, and we encode them, so in, called the encoder LSTMs. On the right, we have the same kind of decoder that we, we saw there with a softmax on top for making the predictions. In the middle, what you have what's called attention. So as it tries to predict the next word, 
it basically says, okay, this is the most interesting part of the input that I care about and uses that to generate the output word. Now, the, the, the picture that I was showing was basically, um, you know, done across 16 GPUs, so eight machines, or eight, or eight GPUs, I think. Then we took that, made lots of copies of that, what we call um, replicas, use parameter servers to share these parameters, and train this across many different machines to get some amazing results. So when we launched this uh, change, it was really the biggest when it closed the gap between the old system and human translations. The old system is the blue line here at the bottom. The human translation is at the top, the brown one. And you know, green is where the, the new system actually got us to. And as you can see, in many languages, it really reduced the gap between the two and got us very, very close. This is amazing because, you know, again, for folks like us who are tr trying to speak across the world, just being able to get that translation makes a huge difference between just not being able to talk versus being able to communicate amazingly well. Um, now let, let's look at some ideas that actually come, start to combine these different pieces together, right? So, so how do we combine vision and language? Um, first thing, for first example is image captioning. So back in 2015, um, we took these images. Again, the, there was a model, what we call Google Net or Inception that you see at the bottom. Basically took the, the model that we had trained on the, on a different set of images, right, took this through and then attached it to the same kind of um, sequence model on the right that we were talking about for translate. And take the output of the images, train this whole thing to actually predict uh, um, the right goal here, basically a caption for the image, and it starts to do really well. So in this case, you know, what you see is the model generating a close-up of a child holding a stuffed animal, which is a pretty good translation of, you know, what's there in the image. Again, it doesn't match exactly what the user says necessarily, but these, these make sense and these could help, um, say, people who have eye disabilities or so on, uh, to still understand what's going on around them, what's there in images that they see on the web, and so on. Uh, this is a great example of putting a number of these things together. So in this case, on your phone, real time, takes a picture in, in your camera, right? Identifies what the text is, so that does OCR for that, basically identifies the characters, the text, and so on. And then from that text, uses translate to convert it, generates the text in the different language of the right characters, and shows it to you right there. And all of this can run right on your phone, so wherever you are. And, you know, for example, earlier this year I was in China and I do not understand any of that text. I could point this to menus, I could point this on signs, and I could really, you know, get a sense of what's going on, where am I, or, you know, what this means. Whereas, you know, without something like this, it's so hard. Um, so let, let's go to some of the other things on the tech side. We talked about search ranking. Let's take, a, take another look at you know, what we can do with this. So just ranking in general, I like to take this example as uh, this is something that lots of folks use in many different areas. So recommendations have lots of different pieces. Um, you know, if you're trying to do any kind of recommendations problems, you might want to retrieve things from databases based on the query and so on. But in the end, you basically need to rank them to show, okay, these are the top recommendations that I have for you. So let's focus on that part. You know, we had a baseline, which was, you know, in this case, what we call a wide model or a, a large logistic regression model that had been tuned for a while. And this is, um, we'll call that the baseline. So the acquisition gain is 0%. And, you know, like I said, we've been trying deep learning for lots of different things. So that's what we did. Okay, we applied deep learning. That gave us almost a three percent gain on a on a good model that worked really well already. Um, in this case, we decided not to stop there and see what else we could do. Right? How do these two differ? So, we have this notion of um, wide and deep now, and this is available in TensorFlow as well, where you don't have just a deep model. What if you could combine some of the interesting things 
from wide models in there as well. So, so this really combines those ideas of what, what it turns out that what deep models do well is they basically generalize well. So if they haven't seen data before, they'll still learn to make some interesting predictions for that. Whereas what wide models do is they're able to memorize very specific kinds of things very, very well. So when we combine these two, let's take a look at what happens. So in this case, we see another 1% gain on top of what we already have with just the deep model. So it's not like, you know, the existing techniques necessarily need to go away of, you know, sometimes combining those two might give you even better wins. So, you know, again, we need to keep all of these tools in mind. And uh, with TensorFlow, we've been trying to make all of those available in one single place. So you can actually combine them. You can try and experiment with different ideas together. So what are some of the challenges, right? We've talked about so many wins that we've had with deep learning. What are some of the challenges that we see ahead? One of the biggest things is data itself, right? Um, as we saw, deep learning does well with data. So if you have larger data sets, it makes it easier for you to do things, but data is not unlimited, right? So, so there are limitations to what you can have do with data. There are often problems where you don't have enough data. Can we still use that? Can we still take advantage of the powerful algorithms? Um, next is compute. You know, we talked about scalability. This is one of the biggest reasons um, deep learning has come where it is. But that, that's also the bottleneck in terms of moving ahead, right? Can we continue to scale more? And so we need lots and lots of compute for that. And the last one is experts themselves. This is a picture of Jeffrey Hinton, who's, you know, of course, the godfather of machine learning or deep learning, as lots of people like to call him. He's amazing, right? But there's really just one of him. There's one Jeffrey Hinton in this world. So how do we... Um, solve these interesting problems? How do we apply these, these algorithms to all the different problems that we want to uh, without necessarily have, having these kind of experts? So the first thing on the data side is, you know, we want to use techniques, what are called transfer and multitask learnings, where we combine data sets from different kinds of tasks or different kinds of problems together and learn from that. Also what's called zero shot learning with a similar ideas. Let's take a look at, you know, one example. So in this case, um, you know, we talked about that machine translation system. The way we were training these models was, okay, I have all these different languages. How do I, you know, for every pair of languages, I collect the data. So going from English to Japanese, Japanese to English, French to English, and so on. Train a model independently for every single language. And then the that worked fine, right? But as you start to talk about the hundreds of languages that are there, there across the world, that gets really hard to scale because you're talking about every single pair in those hundreds. And then there are languages that we just don't have enough data for. Like in this case, we didn't have much data for Korean to Japanese or Japanese to Korea. So we decided, okay, what if you could put all of this together into a single model and train that together? And that's what we did. We basically had a single model which took the input text with the language it was in and then took a language that it want, you want the output in, and it generated that. And it turned out that it was able to actually learn not just the, um, the languages that I had seen direct pairs for, but also languages like in this case from Japanese to Korean without ever having seen a specific example between those two. So this is a great example of going from, um, you know, having something that just works without necessarily having seen data for that specific problem. Um, another example for the co compute side is what if you had larger models because you want more parameters and those parameters help you in learning more interesting things, but they were not activated all the time. So again, going back to translation, what we did was um, there's this idea of per example routing or a mixture of experts layer where you have the same kind of layers, but one of the layers in this case actually has this uh, model on the right where you sort of have lots of different experts and it uses a small network to really pick which expert make the most sense for this particular example. So for certain kind of examples, maybe, you know, experts one and five are interesting. Another one in this case is two and say nine are interested and so on. And then you put that up together. So you have lots and lots of parameters, but on every step or every example, you're only going through some of them, which makes the compute less. 
So it turns out just comparing to the model that we had launched in 2016, uh, this was way bigger in terms of number of parameters, as you can see, something like 60 times or uh, more bigger than the large model, the last model that we had. But it actually trained faster. So instead of six days, it took one day on fewer machines and it actually did better. So the blue score, which is a measure of this, it actually did better. Um, now, on the expert side, let's look at, you know, can we actually help reduce the need for experts? So we are looking at what's called, you know, more automating more of this machine learning or learning to learn as we like to call it. So the current idea is, okay, you want ML expertise, data, computation. What if we could change this a bit where when you don't have access to a good expert, can you use more compute to actually still get a good solution? And so we applied this idea to what's called neural architecture search. One of the biggest things that researchers here do is, is search or look for these architectures of models, these deep models that are most interesting for different kinds of problems. And in this case, we decided, can we train uh, you know, a model that generates these models themselves using a technique called reinforcement learning? So you generate a few models, you test them out, you, you keep training them for a little while, see how well they're doing, learn from which models did well to predict which newer models that might do better, and you continue to do this. And as you do this, turns out you can create some pretty interesting networks that you know we would not think of because they're not uniform, they don't, they're not you know simple as we would like to call them. And turns out they do really, really well. So we had, you know, on the C410 image recognition task, which in this case is a small task with 10 different classes, it actually does, um, you know, almost as good as the human, you know, the best researcher has done in a long time. So th this was an amazing, interesting example. Then on a language modeling task, we applied the same thing. So in this case, there are these sequences that are applied to predict the next word in a sentence. And you know the normal LSTM cell that you see here. So, so this is this cell is really one box in that sequence <clears throat> is uh, up here, which is complex. But the the cell that was discovered by this architecture search is is a few down below, and it made a huge improvement going from sixty six perplexity to sixty sixty two. As you can see, the changes and so on and how they're happening. This is still a pretty big change, and it's really the best that you know, anyone has ever been able to do on that particular task. So, of course, you know, with all of these, we talked about we need lots more computational power. The interesting thing is that deep learning doesn't necessarily need the same computing power that we need for other computers. It's also changing how we think of this computational paradigm as well. So, you know, one of the things about this is you don't really need the same kind of precision as you might need otherwise. So, uh, you know, in typical computing, you do what's there on the right, where you have lots of precision, you do the multiplication, you have maybe 10 decimal places that you care about. Turns out for this, you don't care. You, it, even if you have a lot of approximation, it works really, really well. So you can get away with a lot more reduced precision, which is why we are seeing things go from even 32 bit floating point down to 16 bit floating point. And, you know, that's, showing some improvements in terms of what you can do with it. So based on this idea, we created what's called a tensor processing unit a few years ago. It was a custom design chip for neural net computations. This was one of the things that was used for, um, you know, the AlphaGo matches a year ago with um, where DeepMind's group basically trained a computer to, to beat the AlphaGo champion. Now, earlier this year, we announced and, and showed what's called the cloud TPU. So this is the second generation of TPUs where you could, you know, use on this, this is actually the picture of one board with four different chips on it. And this is really powerful. This allows you to train new models. And the second generation GPU is on just this one device, it basically has 180 teraflops of floating point performance, uh, you know, designed for deep learning with lots of, you know, high bandwidth memory, and it's designed for training and inference. And you can also connect this together in a much larger shape to really make this 
a full supercomputer. So in this case, what you see here, you can do large scale machine learning translation with what used to take 24 hours to train on 32 GPUs now takes you know, a fourth of that time on just an eighth of this TPU part. So what does this mean for us, right? We had, you know, our line currently was maybe slightly before, but as we put more compute and as we go to further to the right, we expect deep learning to do even better and, you know, be able to learn even more interesting things and help us in, in many, many different ways. Here are some example queries that you might see in the future where you're combining, again, lots of these different things where you're, say, asking for certain kinds of documents, asking these models to summarize them for you, and also translate them. Doesn't matter what language they're in, the language barrier should go away. The, you know, going from video or text or vision, all of these, it should be easy for computers to understand really across these different modalities as well. And so, you know, these are some of the examples that we uh, saw today and where deep learning has been used for, and it's been inc incredibly successful art, right? And so before we go, I would just like, like to say, this is something that you should be considering and should, you should really think about. Uh, it's really helpful. Thank you. Now I'll take questions so I can try answering any specific questions that you have on chat. Um, so one of the first questions is, what are the limitations of using Go versus Python with the TensorFlow API? Does the Go version of the API lag behind other versions? Um, so we've started development in Python and a lot of our users are developed in Python, especially the training aspects. So you know, in terms of the, the core API, yes, we often introduce things in Python first. However, if you're trying to take a model and deploy it in production, that part of the API does not change that often. And so, especially for deploying production models, you know, using other languages like Go or Java and so on work really, really well. And we know of lots of teams that do that, uh, you know, some within Google and lots across Google, outside Google as well. Um, another question on TPUs, when TPU is available. Uh, so we are working on making, we announced that we will be making them available in Google Cloud and we are working hard to, uh, you know, make that available more broadly. Um, so we'll, you know, slowly ramp up on people that we can try and work with initially and then slowly, you know, expand to the whole world. Um, you know, another question is what new features the updates of TensorFlow will have in future? So. Um, there are lots of things we work on. You know, I, I can mention a couple here. What the, the first area that I'd mention is we continuously try to make it ever easier. You know, it's been great for lots of people to be able to pick it up, but we, we know that there's a lot more we can do if we can bring it to more people, if we can make it easier for the existing people. And so improving our API is like one of the most recent things we introduced was just handling your inputs. Uh, there's a new data sets API that makes that better. Uh, another area is, is mobile and portability. We are building this new runtime for from the ground up really targeted for mobile that takes the same TensorFlow models and runs, runs them and deploys them. So TensorFlow runs today on mobile, but this is even faster and smaller because it's targeted just for that rather than the same thing being able to run everywhere else. There's a question around any recommendations efforts dedicated to making initial system configuration easier. Talks about, you know, it's been hard to run TensorFlow on Windows 10 and NVIDIA GPUs. Um, it, yes, so it's hard for us as one team to really support every single system, but we try hard. The good thing is the community has been helping a lot. Like in the Windows case, Microsoft jumped in to actually help, uh, you know, make GPUs on Windows, make them work better. Uh, if you see problems, do file them. Uh, if you can help, if you know more about it, if you have solutions, we would love to have contributions. As you saw, there were more than a thousand contributors. That's really what keeps the project going. That's really what makes it better. Um, you are the folks who care about all these different things and you can help make them better and work really well. Yeah. Uh, so here's a question of, uh, you know, will machine mastering speech, vision, and text create AGI or, you know, general intelligence, I guess? 
I, I think where deep neural networks have done really, really well in very narrow problem domains. So even like in images you see, they do amazingly well on ImageNet, right? This is the specific data set that you can do things on. Does that mean that they actually understand everything around us as well as we do? Not yet. By, by far, if you put a computer in a random scene, they would still not be able to do lots of things that a two or three year old can do today. And so, yes, we will make progress in terms of solving very, very narrow problems very well. Um, but, you know, general intelligence is still far away. There's still lots more to be done before we get anywhere closer. You know, these are um, still, you know, the way I see them is these are experts at very specific domains, but not necessarily great at the, the broad landscape. Another question is your views on reducing the model size, the machine learning model size to fit in IoT devices in future. There's lots of interesting uh, work happening in the space. So, so one, there are, you know, companies are starting to build these accelerators that allow you to run the same models on devices um, at low power and so on. For example, uh, Google just announced Google Clips that had this custom chip from Movidius that, you know, an Intel company that really does that at low power, basically understands images at low power. On the other side though, taking existing models and making them smaller, that's an active area of research. There are lots of ideas in the space and they seem to be going well. Now you can really take an existing model or train a model for deploying it on the phone with lower precision or uh, you know, reduce it down using techniques like distillation that seem to work really, really well. So another question is to make it more accessible, are there any thoughts to making a GUI to build new models? And that's, I think that's interesting. There are different parts of the space that you can do well with GUIs, I believe. So for example, if you look at machine learning as a whole, there are parts where you want to do input processing, you want to figure out where the data is, understand it and so on. And visualizing that well makes a huge difference. Then there's the part where you actually defining the model and specifying the model architecture. Visualizing that is interesting. Um, and you know, often people like to play with that. However, when you have a large complex model with a thousand layers, actually working with a GUI to tweak that is, is hard. And often people like to go back to code to be able to make those changes. And, and I think it's gonna be a mix of these. Over time, we will definitely see more of the, the visual element coming in, um, but you know, programming or text itself is not going away for a while. So does Google offer a generic TensorFlow as a service? Uh, pretty much yes. So, so we have what we call, it, it's more than that though. It's not just saying, okay, you, you know, productionize it. it. It's definitely that way you can take a TensorFlow model and it can automate the deployment for you. Let's say that's what you care about where it just scales it up automatically for you. Or it, it can, you know, given your standard TensorFlow things can help you train the model in a completely uh, you know, fully managed way for you. It also includes a lot of other services, for example, hyperparameter tuning and a number of others. When, you know, you start going there, it, can, it has lots of connections to input pipelines. So what it offers is more than uh, just the basic TensorFlow, but everything around it that you need to uh, make machine learning successful. Um, next question is teaching K to 12, what would you consider essentially build, essential building blocks? I, I think that those basic building blocks remain the same. We still need to have, you know, one of the most important things for students is that to, to learn to be curious, right? They, they want to continue to learn. There's, you know, they should be excited about new things. Uh, learning about science, math, all of those are the right basics to really build upon whether you're doing uh, computer science, machine learning, or something else. And, you know, as you go into computer science, this is definitely one of the most exciting areas that's been growing a lot and I expect it to grow a lot more. Um, one more question here on, do you have any plan of turning TensorFlow from static computational graph to dynamic? I, actually, that's something that we are working actively on. Uh, there's an effort that you can follow externally as well um, called eager execution. Um, we, you know, the idea that we want to introduce is we, we have these static graphical models, graph models, and the, they are very useful for a number of things. 
Now, on the other hand, dynamic graphs are useful for certain other kinds of things where we would like to be is a combination of these where we can combine both these ideas with the same set of APIs so you don't necessarily have to learn a new thing, but you can go from, say, trying out a new idea very, very easily uh, in pure Python and then going from that to, the, you know, convert, creating a graph and deploying that in production or taking advantage of that from a performance perspective. Um, is there any model marketplace where people can exchange models or data sets? Um, so I don't know, honestly, there, there are lots of places from an, a model perspective that model where models are available. If you look at GitHub, if you look at our, our model zoo uh, in, in the TensorFlow repo, there are lots of models available in TensorFlow. Uh, in terms of data sets, there are lots of free da open data sets available online on, um, for example, Kaggle.com, which is the site that hosts a lot of competitions and data sets and, and different ideas and kernels as well. One, Last question, does Google plan to join Microsoft Amazon team to integrate Google Now with Cortana and Alexa? I, so that's a completely you know, different team. Uh, I really don't know of any such plans. I don't know if it even makes sense because they are you know, different products doing uh, similar things and competing with each other. But I, I'm sure um, you know, these products will continue to improve. There, there's a lot happening in this area and I'm really excited to see the progress that has been made in the last few years. Thanks a lot. It was great to be here today. Hope you all enjoyed the presentation. Mm -hmm.